ಗುರುಭುವ ಸ್ವಃ ತತ್ಸವಿತೂರ್ವರೇಣ್ಯಂ ಭರ್ಗೋ ದೇವಸ ಧೀಮಹಿ ಧಿಯೋ ನರ್ಚೋದಯ ಓಂ ಶಾಂತಿ 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 ಅನ್ ಸ್ಟಾರ್ಟಿಂಗ್ ಫೋರ್ಟೀನ್ತ್ ವೀಡಿಯೋ ದ ಫಿಲಾಸಫಿ ಆಫ್ ಅವರ್ ಬಿಲವಿಡ್ ಸತ್ಯ ಸಾಯಿ ಬಾಬಾ ನೆಗೆಟಿವ್ ಕ್ವಾಲಿಟೀಸ್ ಮಸ್ಟ್ ಬಿ ಅಪ್ರೂಟೆಡ್ ಆ್ಯಂಡ್ ಡೆಸ್ಟ್ರಾಯ್ಡ್ ಯು ಮಸ್ಟ್ ಹ್ಯಾವ್ ಪೇಶನ್ಸ್ ಆ್ಯಂಡ್ ಫೋರ್ ಬೇರೆನ್ಸ್ ಬಟ್ ಎಟ್ ದ ಸೇಮ್ ಟೈಮ್ ಯು ಶುಡ್ ನೋ ಅಂಡರ್ ವಾಟ್ ಸರ್ಕಮ್ಸ್ಟಾನ್ಸೀಸ್ ಆ್ಯಂಡ್ ಇನ್ ವಾಟ್ ಮ್ಯಾನರ್ ಟು ಯೂಸ್ ದೆನ್ ಆ್ಯಸ್ ವಿ ಹ್ಯಾವ್ ಶೋನ್ ದೇರ್ ಆರ್ ಸಿಚುವೇಶನ್ಸ್ ಇನ್ ವಿಚ್ ಯು ಮಸ್ಟ್ ಟೆಂಪರ್ ಯುವರ್ ಔಟ್ವರ್ಡ್ ಎಕ್ಸ್ಪ್ರೆಷನ್ ಆಫ್ for variants you need to use your discrimination to know how and when to express the quality of forbearance this should be ever firmly established in your heart forbearance and patience are indicators of your inward state they are instruments which you use to counter the negative qualities that are within you the unwholesome character traits which come in the way of realizing your divine truth consider the ability to exercise forbearance in difficult circumstances as a test it is in these times that the negative qualities breed within you will rear their heads and will tend to manifest themselves in wrongful or harmful actions welcome such difficult situation as challenges and opportunities to expose and destroy these negative qualities you do you do this through your forbearance patience and restraint when otherwise your impulse would have been to use words or actions to harm it is only after you achieve patience and forbearance and establish them firmly within you that you will develop the inner peace and equanimity that is needed in order to understand the true principles of spirituality and divinity there are many negative qualities which must be completely shunned by devotees in particular in particular you should not have any attachment any hatred or any jealousy within you if you have attachment hatred and jealousy even in the smallest measure you will not be able to progress spiritually attachment hatred and jealousy and their hand maiden anger are the great enemies of devotees they are the opposites of patience and forbearance we will take up these negative qualities next and learn how to completely uproot them jealousy and hatred twin pests that destroy your peace the divinity is one it is eternal unchanging and everlasting it is the indweller of all bodies as the indweller of the body of living beings it is called the atma the immortal self as the indweller of the world it is called god it is the one divinity present in different forms just as the physical being can be thought of as the body of the atma so also the world can be thought of as the body of god embodiments of love the body is impermanent it comes and goes but the indweller of the body remains the same another name for the indweller is atma the immortal self the universal spirit which underlies everything that can be named or spoken of it is the one permanent unchanging entity which pervades all space and all matter and this is the basis of all living beings it may be called god the atma or the indweller atma and god and indweller are exactly the same they are the one divinity discover the indweller through your own inner peace the sacred scriptures provide guidelines for seeking out and recognizing the indweller 
but scriptural teachings in themselves will not be sufficient to know it. You cannot attain the divinity by merely studying the scriptures. Using the declarations in the scriptures as your basis, you have to make a determined effort to develop inner vision. Scriptures can only show the path. They are like guideposts. They give the directions to reach the goal. You have to walk the path yourself. Following the directions given, you have to undertake the sacred journey and unwavering adhere to it until the goal is reached. For this, the Gita has laid out the path. In the Gita, the direction for the journey commences with the 11th verse in the second chapter. That is the beginning of Krishna's teaching. It starts with the injunction not to grieve for those who should not be grieved for. Who is it that should not be grieved for? What is the way to prevent grief? The Gita teacher declared that there is no point in grieving over things which are impermanent and transient. Bodies and personalities are impermanent and transient. All the things of the world are impermanent and transient. Krishna said, Arjuna, all your grief is for nothing. The five characteristics that make up everything, each of the myriad of things that can be found in this manifested universe is made up of five basic characteristics. For number one, each one is, it exists, it has beingness. Two, each one shines with an inner light, it has luster, it is innately alive with energy. 3. Each has a deeper purpose. It has a reason for its existence. It is dear and a source of joy. 5. Each has a specific name, a category or designation. 5. Each has a given form, either tangible or subtle. It has a distinguishing feature. These then are the five characteristics that are found in everything that can be spoken of. Whether tangible or intangible, once something has been conceived of, we can say that it exists, it shines, it has a purpose, it has a name, it has a form. The first three of these five characteristics make up the eternal truth which never changes. This is the permanent reality, it is the Atma, it is God. It is the indweller, it is the divinity, it is referred to in Sanskrit as Satchit Ananda, meaning existence, consciousness, bliss. For Satchit Ananda, there is no birth and there is no death. Satchit Ananda may be described as the mark or signature of the divinity. The remaining two characteristics speak of the body of the divinity. Name and form are only transient and illusory. They are really just imagination. So of the five basic characteristics that make up everything, three make up the underlying divinity which never changes and the other two are the changing names and forms which make up the world. Realize that all the created things which you see in the world are artificial. They, they all have come at some time and will go sometime in the future in other words. They are subject to birth and death. They can be compared to relatives. Relatives come for a while to stay with you and then go back. They will not stay in the house permanently, just like relatives, happiness and grief come and go. Similarly, everything having name and form is impermanent. To understand spirituality, you must realize that all created things are transient and temporary. Any day these things will disappear, they are constantly undergoing change. Grieving over such things which are impermanent is foolish indeed. If you want to understand the three underlying qualities which are permanent, 
you have to develop certain noble qualities and virtues as has been declared by krishna in the chapter on devotion the aspirant who has attained the 26 noble quality is very dear to the lord but there is no need to have all 26 qualities in a match box you will find a large number of matches if you want a fire you do not have to strike all the matches only one needs to be struck to provide all the fire you want if you fully develop one or two of these virtues within you then the others will also develop of their own accord but they must become an indelible and integral part of you before you can hope to understand the principle of the atma in striving to acquire these virtues you will encounter certain negative qualities within you they are your internal enemy they will try to keep you from manifesting these virtuous qualities jealousy and hatred jealousy and hatred in the previous chapter the virtues of forbearance and patience were discussed now we will take up their opposite evils jealousy and hatred jealousy and hatred are twin thieves the one cannot live without the company of the other there is an inextricable relationship between them they will always take shelter within each other hatred may be compared to an underground pest and jealousy may be compared to an above ground pest together they can destroy a tree consider a tree which is very green which is flowering and producing fruit which is very attractive look at when pests enter this tree the tree will become dry within days one of the pests will go to the branches and leaves above while the other strikes at the roots below while the one spoils the beauty of the tree and the other will try to destroy the very life of the tree they will always accompany each other so it is also with the jealousy and hatred wherever there is jealousy there will also be hatred and whenever hatred is visible you will find jealousy lurking invisibly behind hatred takes on a particular form it manifests itself in various ways for jealousy there is no form it remains hidden under the surface it has been said that there is no person in the world who does not suffer from some jealousy there will be at least a small tendency towards jealousy in every person to make sure that this jealousy and hatred do not enter your system you have to develop selfless love where there is selfless love there is no place for jealousy and hatred to enter and take hold when jealousy and hatred are kept out you can have the experience of divine bliss beauty is a form of bliss whenever there is beauty you will also find joy a thing of beauty is a joy forever what is beauty is it the world which compare beauty to a thing or is it already inherent in the object we have seen how all things undergo change consider all these things which undergo change how long can they remain beautiful only that which is permanent can be beautiful the one permanent entity is god and so god alone is beautiful there is nothing in the world which is more beautiful than god the most important duty of a devotee is to drink the nectar of bliss which emanates from that beauty to imbibe and fill yourself with this divinity which is so full of beauty there is the need for acquiring certain virtues in order to 
develop these virtues you will have to destroy the weaknesses and shortcomings that fester within you being jealous of the divinity jealousy can even come into your relationship with the divinity it is a form of arrogance where in you think of yourself more than you think of the lord and become jealous of the undue attention you feel is being given to the lord there is an example of this in the mahabharata the great epic detailing the war between the forces of righteousness and evil in which arjuna fought on the side of good and lord krishna was his charioteer charioteer during that great war arjuna was seated in the chariot behind krishna who was driving the chariot on the eve of the war arjuna had heard all the teachings explained and expounded by krishna which make up the gita but he was not yet fully ready to practice them he felt that krishna was a very great person a divine teacher but he was not able to understand the full divinity of the lord the great war was going on and some of the most fearsome weapons were being employed on the battlefield on one particular day arjuna was battling with the grandfather bhishma who was the general simu of the other side and was considered one of the greatest warrior of that age during that fight a number of very powerful and terrible missile shot by bhishma entered arjuna's chariot but caused no harm to arjuna arjuna fought brilliantly all day skillfully welding his bow while directing the chariot using his feet to push against krishna's soldiers who would then steer the horses to turn the chariot to the right or left the battle raged unabated with neither side gaining an upper hand until finally towards the end of the day bhishma swooned in his chariot and withdrew from the scene at that point arjuna exhausted but triumphant blew his conch to proclaim victory in the fight that had been raging that day arjuna certainly had faith in the divinity but at the at that moment he also felt a little arrogant in that moment of glory he felt that he was responsible for the victory and that after all krishna had not fought but had only driven the chariot it was after sunset when they turned the chariot towards home as soon as the chariot reached the pandava camp krishna halted it some distance from the tent turned to arjuna and said arjuna please get down and go into the tent arjuna who was a little puffed up with egoism thought to himself i fought and won the battle today krishna was only the charioteer directed by me properly speaking he should get down first and open the door for me that would be the correct protocol and so arjuna said to krishna i think you should get down first but krishna insisted no arjuna you get down first as this interchange continued arjuna developed some dark thoughts and began to feel some resentment towards krishna arjuna said to himself here i have been thinking that krishna was so great and it is surely because i had complimented him and expressed my admiration for him that he is now acting like this considering himself more important well it is my own fault but yet the war is continuing it has to be fought and i need krishna so it would be best if i did not develop any strained feelings between us getting into an argument with him now would certainly not be in anyone's best interest so very reluctantly arjuna got down from the chariot after he got down he stood near the chariot krishna continued pressing arjuna don't stand here go into the tent left with no alternative arjuna entered the tent krishna jumped down immediately 
leaping a long way from the chariot. The moment Krishna came out, the entire chariot exploded into flames and was destroyed to ashes. The divinity never has selfish motives. Arjuna and Dharamraja, his eldest brother, who were both watching from a distance, were astounded. Arjuna asked Krishna, what just happened here? What is responsible for this spectacle? Krishna answered, Arjuna, no one understands my actions. For the divinity there is never any selfishness or egoism. The protection of my devotees is my only concern. The benefit and encouragement of my devotees is my only wish. I kept all those fearsome weapons which were employed by Bhishma and had entered the chariot harmlessly under my foot. As long as I had my foot on them, they were not able to exercise their powers over you. If I had alighted from the chariot first, these weapons would have destroyed you along with the chariot. You would have been reduced to ashes. Being unaware of this, you asked me to get down first. The moment Arjuna heard these words of Krishna, he realized his own arrogant and ignorant behavior. He was exhibiting all the signs of jealousy, finding fault with the divinity, and thinking that he was greater than Krishna can be seen as a form of jealousy. There are a number of important signs of jealousy. Jealousy makes its appearance when you meet a person who has earned greater fame than you, or it will develop when a person has more wealth than you. Jealousy will also show its head when you come into the presence of a person who is more beautiful and handsome. For students, jealousy will soon appear if there is another student who scores higher marks than you. It is the weakness of ordinary human beings to develop jealousy whenever they come in contact with people who excel them in terms of wealth, position, duty, intelligence, and other such qualities. Jealousy will not live harmlessly inside you. The moment jealousy enters all the virtues which you have cultivated over a long time, all the great qualities which you have developed are destroyed. It ruins the human nature. It strengthens the animal torture. It promotes the demonic nature. It has no scruples. It doesn't look forward to back or backward. It is such an in insidious quality that you must see to it that jealousy will never possess you. Enjoy the prosperity of others. Enjoy the progress of others. Enjoy the welfare of others. Enjoy the beautiful beauty of others. This is true virtue. This is one of the most important teachings of Gita. Desiring the good of others is a laudable quality which everyone should possess. Conquer jealousy and you can conquer anything. There is an ancient story of a devout woman who had a reputation of being completely equanimous and free of jealousy. Even her name meant without jealousy. When the three aspects of divinity, Brahma, Vishnu and Shiva, which are the creative, the preservative and the destructive principles of divinity, came to test her, her extreme purity of heart was able to win them over and turn them into little babies. She became like a mother to them. In her presence, they remained happily nestled in her arms. The three aspects of divinity also represent the three qualities in nature, the active, the passive, and the cyclical, which govern all phenomenal life in the world. These three qualities make up our experiences in the world, and the three aspects of divinity are the substratum of these qualities. Therefore, the deeper meaning of this 
Story is that when you are free of jealousy, everything in the world will be like a babe in your arms. You will be its mother. It will look up to you and follow you. Truly, once you are the free jealousy, you will be able to conquer anything. But it cannot be emphasized too strongly that when you have jealousy, it will destroy all your good qualities. You may think that it will destroy others, but in fact it will destroy you, not the others. It will make you sick. You will not be able to sleep well. You will not be able to eat well. Even if you are totally make you sick, you will not be able to sleep well. You will not be able to eat well. Even if you are totally healthy, once jealousy takes hold of you, it will cause all kinds of physical ailments to sprout up in you. It is like an inner consumption, just as the tuberculosis creeps in and consumes, so also jealousy weakens you without your realizing it. It can get into you in any number of ways and will ultimately destroy you. Jealousy is a vicious disease which, is, which must not be permitted to gain a foothold. You must feel that God will always bless you with His grace, even if you are in a lesser position than you think you deserve. You should enjoy the happiness of others. You should be glad to hear of their accomplishments and not feel just sad just because they have things which you do not have. Jealousy is all pervasive in this immortal age. It is prevalent in all types of people, be they worldly or spiritually inclined. It is mostly because of jealousy that People lose their peace of mind and waste their lives or along with the jealousy, backbiting and hatred soon make their ugly appearance. If you are the target of these evil qualities in others, your best protection is the great virtue of forbearance. Here is small story. Forbearance will overcome hatred. Buddha was walking along the countryside begging for arms. He was approaching a village. Many people in that village had a great affection for Buddha. But just before he reached the outskirts of the village, some young rowdies loitering along the road began to jeer at him. A little surprised at this reception, Buddha stopped and sat down on a rock. He said to them, well, gentlemen, what pleasure do you derive from criticizing me? Without giving any reason, they increased their denunciation of Buddha. Buddha said, continue as long as you want. They berated and reviled him to a point where they got tired of their own invective. Buddha's forbearance was so well developed that their hatred could not touch him. At first they were having a good time, but finally having exhausted themselves without getting the reaction they wanted, they decided to go away. As they were walking away, Buddha called out to them, Children, I want to tell you something. In the village just beyond here, there are many people who love me very much. If they were to hear that you have been denouncing me in this wild way, they would cut you to pieces. In order to save you from that danger, I have stayed here on this rock and allowed you to criticize me. In that way, I have given you a gift. Without spending a single cent, without making any effort, I have been able to give you so much enjoyment by allowing you to berate me. Rather than feel unhappy with your criticism, I am glad because I have been able to give you some pleasure and spare you from serious harm. Then Buddha explained yet another important point to them in a way that made an 
indelible impression on their hearts. Suppose a poor monk comes to your house and asks for alms. You bring some food out to him. But suppose the type of food you are offering is re ritually impure and not acceptable by the monk. What will happen then? Since he has not accepted your offer, you will have to take it back and it will remain with you. Similarly, you are offering me all this criticism. These are the arms you are trying to give me, but I am not accepting your offerings. Well then, you will have to keep them. They remain with you. So, you see, all your criticisms are really just being redirected to yourselves. You are not criticizing me at all. One can send a letter by registered post to a friend. If the friend does not accept this registered letter, what will be the postal department do with the letter? It will redirect it back to the person who sent it. If you are criticized some criticizing someone but this person does not accept your criticism then inevitably the criticism comes back to you do not think that by voicing the jealousy and hatred you may be feeling that you will be troubling those to whom these odious sentiments are directed in truth you will only be troubling yourself jealousy and hatred will certainly Great difficulties for the one who is in infected with them. Jealousy and hatred spring from egoism. Here is a small example. Behind jealousy and hatred is egoism. There was a devout religious man who took great joy in cultivating a garden full of beautiful flowers and fruits. Even though he was steeped in spiritual knowledge, he had developed a strong touch of egoism within him. The moment egoism developed jealousy also entered when egoism and jealousy make their appearance hatred automatically joins them. Good look, a pers good took a person personal interest in this errant devotee. God saw that this person, although he had all the proper religious outer trappings, had nevertheless filled his heart with poison. God decided to correct him by teaching him a lesson. The Lord manifested himself in the form of an old mendicant, mendicant and took a stroll by that garden. The old mendicant went to a recently planted tree and greatly extolled the beauty of that tree. Noticing the garden owner nearby, he asked him, Who is the gardener responsible for cultivating such a fine tree? The proud owner puffed himself up and said, Sir, it is I who have brought up this entire garden. I grew this tree and I read all the other trees that you see here as well. By my own efforts, I developed all these pleasing paths and made this beautiful garden. I alone look after everything here. There is no hired gardener. I am the one who draws the water. I spread the manure. I pull the weeds and I remove the pest. I clean the paths. I am developing these beautiful flowers and fruits. Doing all these things for the sake of giving joy to others. In this way, he went on repeating, I, I, I. Appearing to appreciate the beauty of the garden, the old mendicant continued to dwell there for a while, while the owner busied himself nearby grooming his garden. After some time, the mendicant left. A little bit later, a cow entered the garden. She was so weak that she was about to fall and destroy the plants that were there under her body. The owner of the garden saw that this cow was about to spoil his beautiful garden, so he took a small stick and threw it at the cow to chase her out. But the moment the stick touched the cow, the cow fell down and died. Now, in his religion, cows are considered very sacred and should never be 
molested or harmed. Having thrown the stick from which the cow dropped dead, he would now have to suffer the great sin of killing a cow. He was aghast at this terrible turn of events. It was not very long afterwards that the same old mendicant came back into the garden. Walking along the path where the cow had strayed, he saw the dead cow and was shocked. He sought out the owner and urged him to quickly come to the spot. The mendicant asked, Who killed this cow? Who committed this outrage? When the owner did not answer immediately, the old mendicant asked more directly, Tell me, do you know who killed this cow? The owner replied, Surely it was the will of God. Without the will of the Lord, would she have died just like that? Unless she was mean to die, would she fell down and expire just because a little stick touched her? The moment the old mendicant heard this, he told the man, Previously you told me how it was you alone who was responsible for raising this whole garden, how you alone planted and nurtured all these plants and put in all the paths. You were taking credit for all the good things that have happened here, but for anything that is wrong and inauspicious, you put the blame on God. You are an arrogant, self-serving fool, so puffed up with your own importance that you won't even acknowledge the Creator's hands in bringing forth all the beauty that is here. You are taking credit for that which belongs to God. You are even jealous, jealous of God. If not for the will of God, there would be nothing in your garden. At this point, the old mendicant revealed his true identity. He said, I am the Lord himself. I have come to destroy your egoism. The erring devotee fell at the Lord's feet in contrition. The devotee realized how ego had stolen him into, stolen into him, had gained a foothold and then had completely taken him over. Now he understood the deeper meaning of the spiritual teaching that he had been mouthing for so long. He realized that everything is imbued with the divinity and therefore he should see the divinity everywhere and live his life with the knowledge and down to the minutest detail. Everything is under the con control of the divinity. Destroy egoism, jealousy, and hatred with love and forbearance. You must take care that you do not dwell egoism and its henchmen, hatred, and jealousy. Once they take root within you, they will be very difficult to eradicate. When you have become infested with these bad qualities, you may not be so unfortunate as this devotee and get the attention of the Lord so directly to help you eradicate them. You will not be able to exterminate jealousy merely by reading scriptures or engaging in spiritual rituals, but by making a determined effort to transform your thoughts and develop selfless love. You can destroy this pest. Offer up all your negative thoughts at the feet of the Lord and fill yourself with unwavering love and forbearance. So long as you have jealousy, you can never shine. All the great virtues in you will disappear. The Gita has taught that the primary spiritual practice is to develop ideal virtues and apply them in your daily life. In this way, you create favorable circumstances for yourself. When you lead a virtuous life, you will be able to experience the principle of the Atma. But if you do not develop the great qualities and apply them to your daily life, you will never be able to realize the divinity. The light of the Atma is everywhere. It is not limited to any one person or form. 
it shines as an effulgence filling the entire universe. It may take any form and any name. It is the very basis of every name and form. Take for example, the light that is emanating from a bulb or the breeze you get from a fan or the heat you get from an electric cooking stove or the work you get from an electric motor. The effects are all different. The work done by the motor is different from the breeze obtained from the fan. The light obtained from the bulb is different from the food cooked on the stove. The effects are different. The machines are different. But going through all of them is the one electric current. The same is true for the principle of the Atma. It, it differ, in different bodies, it manifests differently, but underneath there is the same unity. The luminosity of the electric light is proportional to the current that flows in the bulb. The light that shines forth from the bulbs can be compared to the atomic effulgence which shines in individuals. Light has no shape or form but bulbs come in various shapes and strengths. An incandescent bulb has a particular form, a fluorescent light has a different form, the dining room bulb may be very bright, the bulb in the bedroom may be quite dim, because of ignorance, you may think that if the one type of electric current flows, powers both the bedroom bulb and the dining room bulb, why should there be a difference in the light? The difference comes about the because of the bulb. Similarly, there is a difference in the expression of love in various hearts. If your love is wholesome, full and complete, you will be able to manifest the fullness of the atmic effulgence and shine brightly. If you have a narrow selfish love, it will be something like a dim bedroom bulb. It is not a question of current. The potential for providing any amount of current is available and ready. You must change the bulb in order to get a greater light. If you are filled with jealousy, then the power of the light will be very small. If you have the effulgence of selfless love, then the power will be something like a 1000 watt bulb. Therefore, develop your love. It is possible to recognize the divinity only with the help of love. Only through love can you experience God. In order to see the moon, there is no need for you to shine a flashlight on it. But the light of the moon itself, you can see the moon. If you want to see and perceive God who is always love itself, then only through love will you be able to see him. It is impossible to see him if you are filled with hatred. Hatred is the very opposite of love. Hatred is something like blindness. However powerful a light you shine on a blind man, he will not be able to see the light. As long as you have bad qualities, the divinity which is very near will not be perceived. When you are free of jealousy, when you are free of egoism and hatred, you will be able to directly experience the effulgence of the divinity. A person who has obtained his eye of wisdom will shine with the God presence. A person who has closed his eyes with ignorance will not be aware of God. By closing your eyes, you will have to search all over for a towel which may be directly above on a shelf, very close by. If you open your eyes, you will be able to place your hand right on it. The wise person whose eyes are open to the divinity and who is not be clouded by ignorance directly perceive God and reaches him. You become wise when you become fragrant with virtues. But if you are saturated with bad qualities, with the doubts and all sorts of jealousy and hatred, you will not be able to understand anything at all. That's why it has been said death is sweet sweeter than the blindness of ignorance. You must free yourself from is why it has been said death is uh, 
you must free yourself from ignorance jealousy is an evil which dwells that ignorance therefore students who have very tender hearts who have a brighter future ahead of them and much progress to make should never give room to jealousy if any person in your class gets an outstanding grade you should not succumb to jealousy you can also work to attain an outstanding grade if you have not achieved that and you also feel jealous then you will be making two mistakes in the first place you have not studied adequately otherwise you would have done better and in the second place you have darkened your heart with jealousy then crying over it is your third mistake you should not develop these bad qualities which are sure to cause you so much trouble they can even destroy a whole family and which was previously happy and enjoying all the goodness of life jealousy and hatred destroy those who possess them while explaining these principles to arjuna krishna told arjuna for your evil cousins the 100 brothers who have been plotting to destroy the pandavas joy and happiness it is their evil qualities which encourage them to do all their wicked deeds people who are jealous attract bad people for company these cousins have with them their evil uncle who encouraged them in their enmity towards the pandavas he is filled with jealousy these are all blind people just as their father is physically blind all 100 brothers are mentally blind they join together and fall in line with one another but you can be sure arjuna that the bad qualities in these people will destroy them as krishna predicted not even one of these 100 brothers survived the war to perform the funeral rites for their parents this is the great tragedy of falling into hatred and jealousy if you want to really understand the gita then you have to start by developing all the good qualities and virtues that have been discussed once these good qualities are part of you you will be able to experience the divinity directly anything you desire can be gotten from a wish full fulfilling tree the gita is such a wish fulfilling tree it will grant you whatever you are ready to receive it will give you the level of understanding which reflects your own particular desires in this age people are interpreting the gita incorrectly because they are filled with so many wrong desires and so the gita has been of little use to them but you must develop your virtue and fill yourself with love then the on lofty message of the gita will shine within you and inspire you to reach the divinity to reach the divinity is your birth right it is your unchanging reality your undying truth the truth and good character the very breath of life krishna said wherever there is exemplary behavior where wherever there is righteousness and sacredness wherever duty and truth are adhered to there will be victory when you conduct yourself in an honorable way when you live by the principle of right conduct those very principles will protect you arjuna always live a sacred and honorable life then you will be leading a life that is truly worthwhile embodiments of love there are seven facets to living a sacred life which are like the seven colors contained in the rays of the sun they make up the standards of virtuous behavior and moral excellence which are the very fabric of spiritual life the first facet is truth the second facet is good character the third is right conduct 
the fourth is sense control the fifth is conscious living with emphasis on restraining one's desires the sixth is renunciation or det detachment and the seventh is non violence all of these principles of right living have been laid down for the protection of the individual and for the well being of society collectively they are referred to as dharma or righteousness truth and dharma truth is the very basis of righteousness just as burning is the nature of free coolness is the nature of ice fragrance is the nature of bluejon and sweetness is the nature of sugar so also truthful is the nature of a human being truth and good characters are ever very life breath when you recognize the innate truth which is your essential nature then you understand your own reality to achieve success in the field of spirituality good character is essential good character can be spoken as having three aspects the first aspect is best conveyed by the words sacredness holiness and goodness the second aspect is best described by the words tolerance compassion and forbearance and the third aspect is given by the words resolve determination and commitment whatever education you have however wealthy you may be whatever position you may occupy whether you are a great scholar or a statesman of you do not have there these three aspects of character you are as good as dead whatever else you may have earned without these three aspects of character all your attainments and achievements will be worthless people pay attention to external human beauty but god recognizes only the inner beauty truly speaking for human being it is their sterling character which makes up their real beauty a person devoid of good character is nothing but a stone you have to follow these seven facets of dharma and let each one of them shine within you for each one of them is completely natural to you the foundation step is truth truth does not simply mean abstaining from lying you have to take truth as your very essence as the foundation of your life you should be prepared to renounce everything for the sake of truth the world conducts itself in the fear of truth and is always subservient to truth when there is no truth man dwells fear and becomes too frightened even to live on the other hand truth confers fearlessness on them on man it is truth which protects the entire world and makes it function truth drives away all fear it is such an important quality that the only when it is being faultless observed will you be able to attain divinity character is the breath of truth important for character is virtue and good behavior humanity will not shine without good behavior virtues good qualities and good behavior all these lend splendor to humanity truth needs to be established from the earlier age in order to serve humanity and realize your innate divinity you have to take truth character and good behavior as your basic right from childhood make the necessary efforts to establish yourself in these noble virtues early in life children are likely to make a number of small mistakes either knowingly or unknowingly fearing that these errors will become known to the elder and there might be some punishment or criticism children will try to hide their mistakes in this way from an early age there is a tendency for the child to develop the habit of straying from truth to avoid blame 
eventually this habit will destroy the very foundation of life and truth will destroy one's humanness therefore children should be strongly encouraged to always tell the truth no matter what without fearing the consequences be these consequences joyful and profitable to the child or what without or should they result in chastisement and punishment just as a foundation is very important for a mansion just as roots are the very basis of tree so truth is very basis of life as a human being if you are wavering in truth there will be no safety and no protection for your life an example of strict adherence to truth can be seen in the life of a great king in ancient times because of his uncompromising stance on truth he was forced by circumstances to give up his wife his son and his kingdom he considered truth as his penance even in the most difficult situation that assailed him he was not prepared to tell an untruth or deviate from dharma eventually he lost his kingdom banished and alone he took up work in a cremation ground when his son died his wife brought the body to the cremation ground although he knew that it was his wife and the body was that of his son still he felt bound to discharge his duty as the person in charge of cremation ground under the most trying test this king never gave up either telling the truth or following dharma he considered truth and dharma like two eyes or like two wheels of a chariot or like two wings of a bird each indispensable to the other even a little fib can lead to unhappiness later right from the very beginning it is incumbent upon elders to teach youngsters the importance of telling the truth here is a small example to show how making up stories to playful playfully befuddle a younger sibling can produce unhappy consequences for a child once upon a time a father wanted to give a special gift to his son on the son's birthday because of the love he felt for his son this father gave the boy a gold coin asking him to go to his mother and get a ring made out of the coin the next day the son had his examinations he kept the gold coin on the table where he was studying now this boy had a younger sister who was very curious and mischievous she entered the room and saw the gold coin she took it in her hand and asked brother what is this he told her it is gold coin she asked where did you get this jokingly he said well it grew up on a tree how could this gold coin come from a tree his little sister asked he then made up of it story and proceeded to tell her a number of fibs he said if you treat this as a seed and sow it by putting it in the ground then pour water on it and tend it and protect it a tree will soon come forth then from this tree you will be able to get many more gold coins she started asking some more questions but he said listen i do not have time to talk to you now i have to study ask me later seeing that he was busy she took the opportunity to pocket the gold coin and left from there she went into the yard and dug a small pit she put the gold coin into the hole and covered it with the soil she poured water on the mound all the while she was thinking of what her brother had told her how a tree would grow out of the gold coin if it was planted he made servant who was watching this little girl from a window so her put the gold coin in the hole when this little girl went inside the house the maid dug up the hole and took the coin after some time the mother came and asked the son to get ready to go to school he wanted to 
give the coin to his mother so that she could she would have a ring made out of it from him as his father had suggested but the boy could not find the gold coin anywhere he went to his younger sister and asked her whether she had seen it she said brother i thought if we could grow a tree out of it we could get lots of coins like that so i have planted the coin in a hole i made in the garden they went to the place and dug ground but the coin was not to be found now the boy was very distressed on his birthday when he should have been very cheerful he was crying he told all this to his mother his mother asked him but tell me son why did you why did your little sister take the gold coin and bury it in the garden the boy did not know so the little girl was sent for and asked why she had done what she did she said brother explain to me how this would turn into a gold coin tree so i did so as he said his mother told the boy because you made up this story and knowingly told an untrue to your little sister the consequence is that instead of being happy and enjoying your birthday you are weeping and not merely that you have also lost the gold coin that your father gave you if children are permitted to tell lies and harbor untruths at their tender age this habit will grow and grow with the years on the other hand if you tell them from the earliest year to take truth as the basis of their lives they will grow in character and be able to achieve many things when when one bad quality goes the rest cannot remain there once was a great teacher who helped many people develop in spirituality whenever anyone came to him to be initiated by him he used to inquire into their behavior and their character to determine the type of qualities they had appropriate to their qualities and stage of evolution he would then give them a sacred incantation a mantra a thief after recognized this teacher as a great man went to him and asked him for a mantra the guru said to him well child what are your qualities what are your defects the thief said my bad qualities are going from house to house in the middle of the night breaking in stealing things since i spend the night in stealing articles during the day i drink myself to sleep drinking is my second bad habit if the police were to catch me then to save my skin i would make up lies and tell them a lot of false information put put them off that's my third bad quality the spiritual teacher asked him well child you say that you steal you drink and you tell falsehoods can you give up one of these three bad qualities the thief thought for a while to himself if i don't steal how can i take care of my family my children and my wife no i cannot give up this only when the body is healthy and strong will i be able to escape when i am caught so i have to get lots of sleep and drink helps me get to sleep in daytime but it is unlikely that the police will catch me very soon so i shall give up telling lies then the great man asked him do you pro- promise that you will always tell the truth from tomorrow onward the thief replied most certainly even from today i will only tell the truth this is what the thief firmly resolved to do and indeed from that day onward he made it a habit to tell the truth wherever he went one hot summer night the thief was out prowling in a nearby town looking for a good place to break into the mayor of this town a very wealthy man was taking rest on the terrace of his house in those days there were no air conditioners or even fans because of the heat and the still sultry night 
air, he was not able to sleep. The thief managed to climb up to this turret. As soon as the thief clambered onto the terrace, the rich man spotted him. Realizing that he was a thief, the rich man accosted him, saying, Hey, there, who are you? Because of because the thief told only the truth, he said, I am a thief in order to find out what this man's plan, plans were, the rich man said. Is it so? Well, I am also a thief. They decided to work together and plan to steal certain valuable things that were kept in that house. The rich man told the thief, there will be quite a few valuables locked up in the safe inside the house of the rich man, but it will be very difficult for us to get into the safe unless we get hold of the keys. Let me break into the house and see if I can manage to steal the keys. The rich man continued, I have been waiting for someone who can keep a watch for me. Now that I have been able to get a friend like you, I will go inside. He left the thief and pretending that he was breaking into the house, he went inside, busing himself here and there. He delayed coming back for some minutes. Then he took the keys and stealthily came out. Now he told the thief, I have the keys, but I looked everywhere for the safe. I could not find it. Let me keep watch and you go inside, see if you can locate the safe and get the valuables that will be kept in by the rich man. As it turned out, the rich man had three big diamonds inside the safe. This thief went inside and soon found the safe. He opened it and took out the three valuable diamonds. Immediately a problem arose in his mind how to distribute the three diamonds between the two of them. As this thief followed the path of truth, a certain amount of righteousness had also automatically entered into him. He brought all three diamonds out, but he told the rich man, Brother, one diamond you can keep, the other diamond I will keep, the third diamond cannot be broken into pieces, I will put it back in the safe for the owner of this house. Let him keep, keep it for himself. Deciding on this, the thief went back into the house to put one of the three diamonds back in the safe. Then he returned to the terrace. After settling this transaction, the thief was about to leave when the rich man said to him, Well, brother, perhaps we can have this kind of partnership now and again in the future. Please give me your address where I can contact you. As he was bound to tell the truth, the thief gave his correct address. The next morning, the rich man, who was also the highest public official in that area, took the address and sent order that a police complaint be lodged regarding the loss of some diamonds out of his safe. He told the police to go to the village mentioned in the address and arrest the thief who was living there. In that particular village, the thief was well known. The police went there and had no trouble finding him. They caught, they caught hold of him and brought him to the mayor. The thief did not recognize the robed official in front of him as his partner of the night before. The mayor then questioned the thief, Well, how did you enter the house? How did you get hold of this diamond? The thief narrated meticulously all the details of his adventure. He told how he had climbed onto the roof. He got into partnership with another person, entered the house, opened the safe, took out three diamonds, gave one to his partner, kept one for himself, and again went to the house, again opened the safe and put back one diamond. The mayor called in his head official and said, go and find out if there is a diamond remaining in the safe. The officer took the keys to the safe to himself. He thought, can there be any thief who will put one diamond back? Thinking this way, he opened the safe, saw the diamond and had been returned there by the thief, pocketed it and went back to the mayor reporting that there was no diamond in the sea, but then the mayor searched the pockets of the officer and recovered the diamond. Immediately, he dismissed the officer from his service. 
द मेयर नाउ एड्रेस द थीफ ही सेड आई नो दैट इन एवरीथिंग यू हैव रिलेटेड यू हैव टोल्ड द ट्रूथ टू मी देयर फ्रॉम फ्रॉम टू डे ऑनवर्ड आई अपॉइंट यू एज माय हेड एडमिनिस्ट्रेटिव ऑफिसर ओनली पर्सन हु इज ट्रूथफुल शुड बी पब्लिक ऑफिशियल Unfortunately, you have become a thief, but your nature is not like that. This person now gave up thieving and become a high official. He continued to practice telling the truth, and automatically, in the natural course of events, he gave up drinking as well. His thieving and becoming an becoming an honest and upright human being in the beginning. by adhering to truth you may be put to a lot of trouble in spite of the trouble you encounter if you pursue the path of only 